and a good morning, good afternoon, and a very good evening to you, the good and good people of the tube. Hope you're today, hope you're doing grand and awesome in the world. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to AQ Wednesday, everybody. Let's get to question one. Let's dive in straight away. Okay, so question one has a few parts to it. So, question one, part A, is uh, I noticed in your guitar collection video you keep all your strat selector switches in the bridge position. Was there a reason for that? Uh, no. There's no reason for me to keep in the switch down. It's just that's where it is um there's like a default i do i do notice that if i if i pick up a strap and the switch is there i will hit it down but i don't know why i do it they're just all there i don't know it just it just i don't know <laughs> there's, no, there's no real thought process behind why the selector switch is in the bridge position it just is so there's no real reason for it no it's not kind of like you know because that's where it should be if you're not using it or that kind of thing it's just where i put it you know it's it's no there's no thought process in it. There's no rhyme or reason. It, it's just where where it is. You know, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's some kind of like some kind of OCD thing I've got of kind of like you know everything has to look the same kind of thing. I do have things like that. I get really kind of like that has to look right. You know, but uh, I don't think it's to do with that actually. I think that's just me being stupid. But anyway, uh, sorry, I got too close. You don't want to ever see my face that close anyway um but no there's no rhyme or reason to why the switch is down all the time in a bruise position it just is I, I, you know i don't really know why i do it it's just a habit that's formed over the years of me playing of when i'm not playing the guitar i just put the switch to the uh to a bridge position and just that's that's the way it is uh invariably there are times when i will leave it in the neck position um i don't really use the middle enough for it to kind of end up being there like but uh but no, it's the same with Les Pauls as well. I mean, invariably, if I'm playing a Les Paul, as soon as I take the guitar off, it's like a subconscious thing I do. Where I put the switch back into the middle. I don't know why. Same with Strats, Telecasters. I always put things to the bridge. Um, there's no rhyme or reason for it. It's just something I've, I, a little habit I developed, I guess, uh, over the years of, of playing. You know, I, I don't know why I do it. I just do it. So, yeah, but there's no rhyme or reason for it. It's not like, you know, to save a selector switch or any kind of like, you know, big kind of um, mysterious secret of why that happens. Actually, yes, it is. Why does Dave keep... No, no, it's not. It's not. Anyway, um, but yeah, so I hope that's actually your question, uh, that, that first part. So we're going to move on to uh, question one, part two now. Yes. Ha. Ha. Yes. Uh, how did you discover Jeff Buckley? Now, I don't know. I was thinking about, when, when I wrote down the question, I was like, how did I find out about Jeff? And I honestly, I, I honestly don't know where he appeared from. Which is a bit weird, because I know where, you know, 99% of my, you know, my favourite guitarists or heroes, I know where they, where they come from. Jeff, I don't remember exactly what song it was, where, it, you know, where I was when I heard it. You know, it, it was, it was just, he's just there. It's weird. I don't really know why. I don't know where he comes from, but he's not actually on the wall. I need to rectify that. That's that's not good enough, is it, Dave? We need to get Jeff on there. Um, honestly, I don't remember how I discovered him. I really don't. I, it's bizarre. It's really bizarre. Like I can, you know, I can tell you about Rory. I can tell you about Jimmy, John, Peter Green. You know, Mike McCready, Kirk Cobain. I can tell you all about how I discovered those as artists. Jeff. Thinking about it earlier on, when I wrote the question down, just kind of like pondering it this morning, like, you know, how did I discover Jeff Buckley? I don't know. It was possibly Hallelujah that I heard first, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, I really don't know. I don't know where he came from. He was just, he's just there. It's a bit spooky, actually. I've, I, honestly, I've never thought about that before this came up. And thinking about it now, it's a bit weird because I'm like... Well, I don't know where he comes from. I don't know where um, that uh, where he where he came in. I, I just don't know. I, I don't remember what year. Yeah, you know, I, I feel like I've been listening to Jeff Buckley for ages, and I have, but for the life of me, I cannot think of how I discovered him. You know, was it? somebody else discovered him and said I should check him out or or, or, or what it was. I, I honestly don't know, which is a little bit weird. And it kind of freaks me out because Rory Gallagher, I was sat in this room with a computer that used to be where my amps are now and randomly stumbled across Bad Penny in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the 70s of him playing it in Paris. 
me hooked. Jimi Hendrix, Voodoo Child, John Fashanti, Top of the Pops playing Under the Bridge. You know, Mike McCready doing the live solo uh, at Rock Am Ring. Um, you know, Peter Green was, oh well, you know. Um, I can I can name all these eyes of how I discovered them. Jeff, I don't know. I honestly can't think. It's really, really weird. Like, I can feel my brain's working really hard to try and remember. I mean, there's, and I come up with nothing. There's just nothing there. He just appeared. You know what I mean? I'm a big fan of Jeff. I love Jeff. I mean, he's just he's just immense. Um, but honestly, I don't know where he came from. I don't know if my if my sister got into him and then in so her getting into him, I got into it. I don't know. I really don't remember. I really don't, which is really creepy. You know, and uh, that's going to haunt me all day. You know, for quite a while, I think, actually. That's quite strange. I don't know where he comes from. I don't know where he fits in here you know he's always he just feels like he's always been there which is a bit creepy you know what i mean there's 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 something with jeff there really is but um yeah i don't know i really don't know it's it's very very bizarre that one people with jeff. i really don't know how i discovered jeff he just appeared to be there all of a sudden okay so um moving on uh to the next part uh the next uh the next two parts and uh, question one are about jeff as well so let's move on to that because as i say that's freaking me out uh, okay, so what's my favourite Jeff Buckley song? That's really difficult. Um, there's kind of like a tie, I suppose, really, between um, Eternal Life, the road version, not the album version. I do like the album version of Eternal Life. Uh, and it starts like Can't Stop. If you listen to Jeff Buckley's uh, studio version of the album Grace of Eternal Life, it starts with... Which is... Wicked. Anyway, um, you know, considering it was way before Can't Stop was even a thing. Anyway, um, but it's kind of a cross between Eternal Life or like the, the, the live version with the really heavy, heavy thing and Forget Her. Um, although, if you've never heard Jeff Buckley sing Dido's Lament, you owe yourselves to go over to another YouTube tab and put in Jeff Buckley, Dido's Lament. That is... not only terrifyingly scary, because unfortunately Jeff is no longer with us, and that song has certain things about that, being Lament. The way he sings it, the voice on that man is terrifying it's so i, I don't even know i don't i don't even know how to describe that it's just absolutely immense so people of the tube i really do urge you to go and look up jeff buckley dido's lament and listen to that because it's just it it'll break your heart that's what it will do it's insane and some of the lines in it are just kind of very very poignant considering like you know he's no longer with us and unfortunately i always feel robbed when it comes to jeff we got one album we got a couple of live albums and we got the sketches from my uh, sweetheart the drunk uh the kind of the second album but not really it's kind of demos you know we never really got any more of him and i feel robbed we should have got more of jeff and we didn't and that's always naff that's very naff indeed anyway um that's a very noisy car um but favorite jeff song i don't know because forget her is amazing i love forget her um i love eternal life you know but there's dream brother there's um mojo pin i mean hallelujah is obviously a masterpiece you know above any to me any, you know, a lot of people have covered Hallelujah. It became a bit of a mainstay for stupid pop, silly TV shows for people going, you know, my pet hamster died and now I'm going to sing Hallelujah for it. You know, it became a bit of a thing and it became a bit cheesy, the song Hallelujah did. Because it came just kind of like a bit of a has-been song because of all these cheesy pop versions of it people go Hallelujah! like that and sound like they're like going out their mind um while they're singing it but all you have to do really is go back to jeff's version 
Leonard Cohen version obviously is great as well, but Jeff's version is a masterpiece. I think even Leonard Cohen said that his version beats all, and it does. You know, what made Jeff even start to do Hallelujah in the way he did it, we should be forever grateful for, because my God, you know, it's just insane. The only person I've ever seen get close to Jeff Buckley's version of Hallelujah and the, the, the emotional impact and, and the power that Jeff put into that song is Miles Kennedy. Uh, he's the only other singer, uh, guitarist, who's ever got anywhere near Jeff, in my opinion. And uh, being that Jeff is a massive influence on on uh, on, on on Miles, and, and you know, he's, he's one of the reasons why he wanted to be a singer in this and the other. You know, the, the emotion he can convey miles can convey in his voice when he sings hallelujah is, is so akin to jeff you know that amazing version of uh alter bridge played the olympia i think it was in paris and uh miles plays hallelujah on jeff's telecaster well technically it's not jeff's telecaster it's always borrowed but it's jeff's telecaster uh, he plays hallelujah on on jeff's telecaster and um it's you can see how heavy that is for him being a fan, because the last time that guitar was in that building, Jeff Buckley was playing it. So that would have been a very heavy thing for Miles, being a big fan of Jeff or super fan of Jeff. You know, to play his guitar on that stage, play that song. I am amazed he, he was able to do it. And uh, funny enough, I have a bit of a story um, about that, because uh, when I was in Paris at uh, Matt's Guitar Shop, Obviously, Matt had Jeff Buckley's Telecaster for a while, which I wish I could have played. I'm so gutted I missed out on that. Damn you, Matt Bellamy. Uh, but uh, Matt was telling us a story about Miles because uh, Matt came up with the idea because he, he knew Alter Bridge were playing the Olympia. He said, would you, if I bought Jeff's Telecaster down, would you like to play it on stage? You know, and um, what an awesome thing. But Miles apparently was like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I can do that. So he was really hesitant, apparently, and apparently he, he he eventually agreed to do it, and he was gonna do he was gonna he was gonna play Hallelujah on Jeff's Telecaster, but he wanted to get uh, permission from Jeff's family to do it first, and that to me is beyond awesome. What an awesome thing to do on Mars Kennedy's behalf. He could have just gone and done it without. But he didn't. He what? He rang Jeff Buckley's family and said, "I'm doing this with Jeff's guitar. Is that okay with you? Because if it's not okay with you, I won't do it." Obviously, they said it was, and we have that amazing performance on YouTube, which again is another thing you should check out. People on YouTube, Miles Kennedy, Hallelujah, Olympia in Paris. Um, I can't even imagine. Matt said he Matt was there, obviously, and he said it was just so emotional, you know. And I can imagine it was. I, I, can, I can't, you know, my God. I, it's so strong, you know, so strong. But what an ace thing for, of Miles to have done is reach out to the family and actually ask them to, to if it was okay. I mean, that shows immense respect that sometimes is missing in musicians. You know, that is, I'm not, I'm, you know, you're not doing it just for the sake of doing it. You're literally doing, yeah, you, you want... Uh, you want permission to be able to do something. You're not just going to do it willy-nilly. It's just like, you know, that, that's immense to me. Uh, and Miles Kennedy was always very high in my opinion anyway. I love his voice. I love the way he is. I love the way he thinks and is. Uh, and then when Matt told me that story when I was in Paris, I was just like, whoom, through the roof. Absolutely through the roof. Respect for that man is insane now. You know, it really is insane. Um, yeah, amazing. Absolutely amazing. So, um, so for, yeah, coming back to the thing, I favorite Jeff Buckley song. I don't know. I mean, it's really hard to pick one. Like I say, let's forget her. There's, there's, there's all, so there's all sorts. You know, there's, there's, there's all sorts of Jeff songs that I, I love. You know, Grace is one of those albums that is a perfect album. You can put it on, and you don't have to skip a song. They're all amazing. The only song that uh, I'll tell you, what, I will tell you one thing. Um, the only song that never really, it, it didn't catch me for a long time was uh, So Real. Um, that song took me. A, it took a long time to grow on me. I love it now, but when I first heard it, I didn't like it at all. It really took time to grow on me. So real. The rest just caught me instantly. But so real took a bit of a, a long time to uh, to click. But uh, I love it now. It's great, great. I love the chords as well. But I keep forgetting how to play it because I, I don't play it enough. But anyway, 
So yeah, so uh, the last part of question one is, because I'm going to move on because we're out of time. Uh, cool, last part of question one was, what, what is your favourite part about Jeff's guitar playing? I think it's his restraint. Jeff was an amazing guitarist. You know, but he never really, it was all about the song. You know what I mean? And it's just so cool. I mean, his use of chords as well. You know, all, you know, different, you know, different chord voicings and stuff like that. And the way his voice and his guitar are just extensions of him. It's not just his guitar as an extension, like his guitar and his voice are extensions of him. It's, just, it's, it's all this, it's free becoming one, you know, at that point. It's, it's insane. But my favourite part of his guitar playing is just like his melodicness, you know, his, his, his use of melody and use of chords and, you know, thing, everything's in the right place and everything's so perfect, you know, and he's it's such an ear for melody that, again... He's, it comes close to Kirk Cobain when it comes down to melodies. Like, no one, no one will ever write melodies like Kirk Cobain ever again. You can emulate it, but you're just emulating Kirk. You're not coming up with it yourself. You know, it's not coming from nowhere like, you know, it did with Kirk. And Jeff's the same. Like, some of those melodies that Jeff comes up with and those chord progressions just seem to just come from nowhere. They're just him. They're just Jeff Buckley. And... That's what I love, you know. I mean, it's not just his guitar player. I just love him in general. It's just insane, you know, just insane. Um, he was he was the whole thing, you know. He was the whole thing. He really was, and we were de we were definitely robbed of him, and that's rubbish to say the least. Anyway, I'm going to move on because I won't get to more questions if I'm not careful. So yeah, so I hope that's this question. Give me on to question two now. So question two is. Uh, what's your top three fuzz choices for a John Frusciante tone? Uh, top three fuzzes, uh, well, my favourite is the FZ3 by Boss because that is my favourite period of John's fuzz tone, the Californication fuzz. Basically, that, that pedal he used for that, 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 that era, that, that Californication tour, that's my favourite and it still is my favourite fuzz for John Frusciante. So that's my favourite. That's the number one. But they're really hard to come by. Uh, I'm a very lucky bugger because, you know, I've got one. And it was it was a gift from a very awesome YouTube uh, subscriber. So thank you very much indeed. Um, but yeah, that's my favourite John Fuzz sound is the FZ3 by Boss. But having got, um, you know, the, the, fr the Frust Right, uh, the Frust Right, I don't know how you'd say it properly, that definitely comes in second it's just got that right thing you know what I mean? it, you, when you combine it with ds2 you just have the that's a galley intro you know and you've got all those kind of like stadium arcade things so that's number two by far it's just wicked number three is the sundial by hubcap john which is probably my favorite fuzz ever uh just because it's just ridiculously good i just love that fuzz pedal it's my favorite fuzz pedal um be, it, there's just something in that pedal that just it just gets, especially when you put it into the middle set, uh, position, because you've got a three-way switch on it, which is more noon and night. If you put it in the in the noon set, in the middle set, you get almost. It's not DS2, it's not Fuzz Right, it's not Boss FZ3, but it's somewhere in the middle of all that lot, and you can really kind of like it. Just sounds wicked. So that would be my three. So my number one of all time is the Boss FZ3. The second one is the Fuzz Right uh, by the Ferry Customs and JFFX. And the third is the Hubcap John uh, Sundial. Uh, they're, they're, they're the ones I'd recommend. They're just immensely good. And they're, they're my three favourite fuzzes. Uh, and next to the Double Muff as well. I've got I've got four favourite fuzzes, really, because there's the Electro Harmonics Double Muff as well, which I absolutely adore. But don't necessarily use it as a fuzz. I use it in a different way. It's it's a bit weird how I use the FZ, uh, the FZ3, the, uh, the double morph. I, I use it in a very funny way, which I'll get to in a video soon. I'll, I'll explain. Anyway, um, but yeah, there'd there be, the, there be, the, there be the four I, I recommend. So the next part of question two was, uh, do you think the Big Muff Pie is a good deal? Um, I don't really like the Big Muffs. Uh, I, don't, I don't like them. I, I, I've tried a few. I've only ever tried one I liked. It was while I was in France. Uh, my friend Nicole was borrowing one from her friend and I plugged it in and I was like, that sounds really good. Did I want one? No, but it did sound good. You know, out of all the big muffs I've tried, you know, the Russian ones and all that kind of thing, that that one sounded really good, but it still was... It still wasn't quite the sound I like, you know. It, it still wasn't quite right. So, 
Personally, I wouldn't go for it. But again, this is just my opinion. Don't take what I say as kind of like, you know, just because it doesn't work for me, it won't work for you. You might love it. Try it. You never know. But for me, I don't really like the Big Muffs. I don't like the Big Muff pie. I've tried it. And I don't like, you know, the other stuff like that. It, this don't really work for me. I've never tried the English Muffin, which I really want to try. Because I know John used that on Stadium Arcadium a lot. And I really want to try that fuzz at some point. But, um, yeah, it can wait. I'm not in any rush. Okay, so... Um, Ill part of question two is, is the MXR micro amp really important for John's tone? No. Uh, I've said this a million trillion times. Uh, the MXR micro amp is not the most important pedal for John's tone. No. People treat it like it's the holy grail. Like, you know, you need it. You know, it's the most important pedal. It's really not. It's probably the least most important pedal. You know, there's a DS2. I mean, I, I still stand by DS2, Ibanez Wah. Those two are the most important pedals for John. You know, because even Chorus can take a back seat. Because John doesn't use Chorus all the time. Yes, it's there, and it is a mainstay of John's tone, and it has been for all time. But he doesn't use it all the time. You know what I mean? It, it's not on every song. You know, uh, the Ibanez is Wire and the DS2, I still think, are the most important pedals to forget for John. You know, I really... I think the MXR ranks super low. You know, the Micramp ranks super low. I just don't feel it's the most necessary pedal. You know, yes, John did have one, and yes, he used it for solo boosts and gain boosts every now and again. But it's not important. You know, you can get that out of any pedal. You know, you can get that kind of, you know, that clean boost. You can get it out of any kind of pedal. You don't need an MXR to do it, and you don't really need it anyway. It's not really important. It's just because John has it, people think, you know, it's important. It's not. It's like the Mooga Fuga pedals. You know, just because John's got them and, you know, use them it doesn't mean you need to have them you know you can get around things and it's more fun to try and get around things i think than to have to go i need to get that you know i think like i say i always go back to the things like i think there's two major important pedals the ibn is one the ds2 and then like you know obviously net below that is chorus and then you get delay uh and then you know that's pretty much it that's all you really need you know you don't necessarily even need a fuzz because the DS2 covers that. You know, the DS2 covers that nicely. You don't really need a fuzz. It's cool to have, but you don't really need it. You don't really need a step filter because John only, John, John only ever used it in throwaway, throwaway television. You don't really need the step, the, uh, the Mooga Fuga low pass pedals and all that stuff because John did, eventually didn't use them. He used the Wawa pedal in Danny California. Um, you don't need half the stuff, you know. You don't because it, some, were, some effects were just song dependent. You know, and the thing is, if you get like a multi effects unit like uh, the Zoom or the Line 6 HX or whatever, uh, you know, invariably there'll be a step filter in there, there'll be a delay in there, or there'll be some kind of weird modulation there you can get to sound like those Mooga Fuga pedals. Yes, it won't sound 100%, but you can always approximate, and it's good fun to go chasing these things uh, with other gear. So it's, you know, the MXR, to be honest with you, is literally throwaway, in my opinion. And I'm sure. Loads of John Fashanti uh, guitar notes would be screaming at me saying, that, no, it's not, no, it's not. But to me, it is. I've never used one. I've tried one. My brother's got one. And I, I tried one and I hated it. I just didn't see the point in it whatsoever. And I've, I'll never, never bother with one. I just don't see the point, you know. Um, so, yeah, is, a, is the MXR micro really important? No, not in my opinion. But this is just my opinion. So, you know, take that, you know, for what it is. Yeah, it, it, just because I say it isn't, yeah, but it's, again, yeah, we can only we can only see things from our uh, perspective. Okay, so last part of question two is, uh, how do you achieve a Venice Queen intro volume swell? It's literally that. It's just a volume swell. You know, you turn your volume all the way down, you hit the note, and you roll the volume in, and then roll it out again. So like that. You know, I can't, I, I ain't got my amp on, but, you know, it's to say volume all the way down, play the note, roll it in, roll it out, roll it down, play another note, roll it in. Roll it down. And that's it. Uh, John, I think... John doesn't have delay on with that. It's just his Line 6 delay modeler. Uh, it, it, he could have reverb on. I doubt it, personally. Uh, I think it's just um, him just volume swine on Venice Queen. I don't think for one second there's reverb. There's no delay on it, definitely not, to make the, sustain, the note sustain. It's just him just doing volume swells. So, yeah, it's, it's just that. Very simple. Uh, but if you are in a if you are in a very dry room, add reverb. It adds ambience and it sounds better. 
you know, uh, it'll just it'll just be more inspiring. Okay, so uh, so yeah, so I hope that's your question. I'm gonna move on to question three now. Okay, so question three uh, for both amp and guitar for for both amps and guitars, do you prefer tone and sound or functionality? For example, would you pick an amp solely on how it sounds if it didn't have many effects? Yeah, it's all about how it sounds and how I. You know, if, if I can get the sound out of it that I want, then if it's got if it's got bells and whistles or it doesn't, I don't care. You know what I mean? Um, CR120 is a great example of that. I mean, I, I'm saying that, so is the MG. You know, uh, these amps, I've had, I've been using the MG Pro, the, this is the longest running amp I've ever used, the MG, and CR120 is the second, and then the Katana's after that. But the MG is one of those amps that I found I love the overdrive channel, and that's all I've ever really used. I, I do everything else with um, with pedals. But if I do plug into the thing, I can get everything I want out of an amp. And it's only got... It's got reverb and it does have effects, but I still... You know, it sounds wicked. It's all... You know, it has to sound right. You know, there, there's loads of amps I've plugged into that, like, just don't sound very good. And it's just like, no, I'm not interested. Uh, the CL120 doesn't have many features at all. It's two-channel with reverb. But... It's one of my favourite amps because it just sounds immense. So yeah, and, and the same with guitars. I mean, yeah, I mean, it ugh, go away. Um, it fundamentally comes down to does it work for you? You know, it's as simple as that. You know, does it work for you? Does it feel good? You know, can you can you do can you express? Can you say what you want to say with it? You know what I mean? That's the most important thing. And and, and if you can't, then it's not right for you. Yeah, you know, it, it's really quite simple uh, well to me I, I i think that way anyway um it's not the same way for everyone but to me i just like how things speak to you and you have to listen to things as well you have to be open to hear what they're trying to tell you a uh, good example of that was when i bought my white tokai custom uh that same day like i say in the guitar shop came in a gold top with a dart bag and like I say, I mean, I am a gold top fanatic. I love Les Paul gold tops. Uh, I don't actually own one, which is a bit weird. But um, so when I was buying that white custom and then all of a sudden there's a gold top there. Now, if I had gone by my lust, if you will, for a gold top, I would have bought the gold top and left with that and had a not as good guitar. Because it didn't sound as good, it didn't feel as good, it didn't play as good, and it, in all fairness, it didn't speak to me at all. Whereas the custom was like, you know, I'm the one, and he what it was not wrong. And that's the thing is, I think you've got to listen to things. I I do certain things that may seem really weird to people when I come down to kind of like buying guitars or an amplifier or stuff like that. I I I, I like to feel what it's trying to tell me. You know, is it right? Is it wrong? You know, invariably, if something's wrong, it'll say, I'm not for you. Invariably, if it's right, it'll go, yes. You know, and you have to you have to listen to that thing. And, and that's music telling you what to do, which you should always listen to, listen to anyway, because that's what guides us. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's all about how it sounds and can I emote for it and get can I get out what I want to say with it? You know, if I can't, then I'm not interested. I'm just not, you know. It's, it's, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna waste my time on something I can't work with, or something that doesn't want to work with me, you know. So you just have to listen to what things are trying to tell you, and and and, and go where you need to go. And it was immediate with this thing, the MGs, and it was immediate with the CL one twenties and the Boss Katanas, and it was immediate with this guitar, apart from the selector switch, um, you know, and and certain other guitars I've got, and other, other amps I've got, and pedals, you know, these the things I've got are immediately right for me. The things I don't have anymore, or don't, I've, I've tried and, and, and don't have, that's because it never worked out. You know, it's as simple as that, really. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's got to feel right. And again, as it comes down to that, again, people are cheering, I always talk about it. But if it doesn't feel right, it's wrong. You know, it has to feel right. You know, you have to go, yeah, that feels good. You know, it feels right to me that I'm doing that. You know, you can't, you don't want to be fooling yourself into thinking like, you know, I've got to do this because they said so. You know, I, oh, I need I need to go and buy this guitar because somebody's told me so, even though I don't want that style of guitar. You know, you've got to go by what you want and what feels right to you, not what feels right to somebody else. Because what feels right to them 
isn't going to be right for you because we're all individual, we're all different, and that's the way it should be. So, um, so yeah, so it's all about, yeah, I, I would say it's, it's really nearly all about functionality and just kind of like, you know, you've got to, you just got to walk your path, you know, like I've, I've done a video on that. You know, you just got to walk your path and, and listen to you more than anything. You know, you just got to follow yourself and, and know, know where you're going, you know, and uh, just do what feels right to you. You know, for me, it is, it's like, you know, if it, if it feels right, then it's right. If it feels wrong, it's wrong. It's as simple as that. And I can hear what things are trying to tell me uh, and I can feel what things are trying to show me and stuff like that. And, you know, sometimes things will come along and you'll need them for a certain period of time and then you can let them go. And then some things will come along that you'll just have forever. You know, it, it, very, some things are very transient. Some things aren't. Some things are just dead ends. You know, it, it, it's the way it is. You know, it's life in general, isn't it? Getting all zen. But yeah, so, um, but yeah, so, you know, it's, it, you, you, you sort of go by what's right for you. You really do. Okay, so, uh, how are we doing for time? Okay, we're okay. So, but yeah, that's, for me, that's the way it works. But, um, yeah. Just for what, for what that's worth. Okay, so anyway, um... I hope that made sense. As usual, guess who's there? Not the marshals, Mr. Fear. He's like, you ruined that question, Dave. Did I? Probably. I don't know. Did I? I don't know. People tube. Uh, scared. Okay, so I don't know what's going on. So anyway, I'm going to move on to final question today. Question four. Question four today is what... Uh, oh my God, I can't even read my own writing. My writing is basically like somebody's got a dead spider, dunked it in ink and dragged it across a page. Uh, your <laughs> sorry, I'm gonna have to try and figure out this out. So, ah, it's use okay. The it looks like U R E, that's horrific. Anyway, that's not even a word. All right, um, so question four is what do you use to get your guitar uh sound to what do you use to get your guitar to sound so vocal? Uh, I, I don't, I, did, I didn't know, did um. Uh, I just use lots of distortion most of the time. I love distortion. I love sustain. I love as much sustain as I can get on a guitar. Uh, you know, I stack distortion pedals on top of distortion pedals. You know, um, that's something I've always done because I, just, I like to be able to hold a note and really let it go, you know, now the tough style. But um, I, I, that's just what I like. I, I like to be, I let it sing and and sustain i love sustain i've always loved it I, I don't really like playing super clean where everything's kind of plinky and there's no real sustain there it doesn't really do anything for me in all fairness like it kind of drives me a bit balmy i really don't like it i like distortion i like overdrive i don't like clean clean it doesn't work for me um but I mean, in invariably the the pedal i found that i can feel that sings the most is the boss ds2 and that's the pedal I invariably use the most if I want the guitar to really sing. I'll go to the neck pickup and I'll stick on the DS2 and everything's on 10, including the DS2, and just let it fly. You know, because it just sustains and it sings and it's got such a warm, uh, warm, mellow, but cutting voice, the DS2. It just, it's just immense, you know. I'm using the DS2 more these days than I am the governor, actually, which is a bit... You know, weird because well, it's not weird at all. It's the way it is. It's it evolved. It's evolving. But um, I find that the sound of a DS2 is more um, what I want to hear when I'm doing like a mellow guitar solo. If I'm doing a big kind of gnarly rock solo over governors, there, you know what I mean. But like for mellow stuff, which I like to play most of the time, and I, I really let the guitar sing in a moat. Um, the DS2 just works so well for that, and I, I love it for that. It's just got, it's got the right amount of distortion, the right amount of tone, and everything, and the right. T uh, excuse me, with the turbo mode, it's just got the right tonality. It's just immense. So um, yeah, I mean, it, I would say the DS2 is probably the the pedal, but then again, there's the wah pedal as well, because I like to use wah pedals. In a, in, in not necessarily kind of like having it always going wah, 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 wah. I like to be able to just kind of stand on the thing and kind of have it wedged because sometimes you can find that kind of mid ground and 
get a kind of mid-range honk out of it, but it really sounds expressive. It, 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 I, I don't want to sound like it sounds like a human voice because I think that's egoy to say that. But um, you know, I, I, I will just sometimes I'll just turn the wire pedal on and just leave it in a position. I'll just have my foot on it, and it, it, you know, I, I'll maybe emphasize certain notes by pushing it forward, pulling it back. But there are times where I'll just stand on it, and I like to be able to just kind of stand on it, and. Um, you know, it feels it feels good. It feels right. You know, when I when I'm when I'm doing that kind of thing. So yeah. So it just depends, really. Um, but the DS2 and the, the Wah are always been a match made in heaven for it singing, and obviously with the jackhammer as well. Um, yeah. So the jackhammer, the DS2, and the 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 Wah Wah pedal, depending on what the Wah pedal I'm using at the time is, that would be my happy you know that's my happy singing kind of guitar voice it sounds a bit egoy to say you know that but um but i i, I really i feel it really you know it's it, it's got the sustain and so when you hold a note especially if you're on the neck pickup it's got that it's got that warmth and you can really let that note bloom and sing and, and sustain and, and it really just goes a long way and i like that so um, I mean, if I was gonna say how do I how do I get it, I don't really know, but I'd say the DS2 Wah and the Jackhammer is is what I'm using most of the time. Uh, it's what I was using in Intro Jam today. Um, invariably, 70, 80 percent of the time, that's what I'm using for Intro Jams. You know, Jackhammer DS2 and the uh, the Ibanez WH10 V2 Wah or the Triangle Labs uh, uh, WHX. Um, or whatever you know, it's it, it's it's those kind of free components really, and obviously you know the orange or the Marshall or the Boss guitar, and, and obviously guitars as well, because certain guitars uh, sing in a different voice. You know, but, um, some some have a, a more kind of aggressive voice, some have a more mellow voice, and you know you just gotta feel where you are that day. You know, I don't I don't like being kind of like. Like I've got to play this guitar today. If I don't, if if it doesn't feel right, I won't play it. You know, I I I pick guitars based on. Well, I don't I don't pick guitars. Music picks guitars. Today wanted the Chapman. It wanted this guitar today, and it wasn't wrong. That intro jam was. That was this. Yeah, it was the second thing I played today. I played something else in E, and it went uh, like this. But I like that too. Uh, I like that so much. I was like, that needs developing. It needs work on. That's not an intro jam. That's a song. So I was like, well, that's not. That's not. That's not an intro jam. That's not the intro jam. And I could tell it was like, no, no. That's really cool. But that's a song. That's not an intro jam. So I was like, okay. Well, what's next then? And it just went. You know, and all of a sudden I've got an intro jam, you know, and it's just all about listening to what music wants from you and obeying it, you know, and just just going unconscious to it. Let it take over. Let it control you. You don't need to worry about a thing at that point. You know, it will just guide you. It will control you and it will take you. And that's all that matters at that point. Just unconscious thought. But it wanted this guitar today. You know what I mean? Uh, tomorrow's vid, who knows what guitar it will want, you know. It might want the Brian May guitar. It might want... I don't know. Who knows? Who knows where it's going to be? But, um, but yeah, um, it's, it's, it's all about that thing, but it's all about, again, it's all about feel. You've got, it's got, it, you know, feel is so important. I really, I mean, I harp on about that far, probably far too much and it probably gets on people's nerves. But for me, it's, 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 it's the everything, you know what I mean? To music is, is to feel it. You know, you've got to feel it. And if you're not feeling it, something's wrong, you know, if you're trying to do something and it's not happening, that's probably because something in the mixture's wrong. You're using the wrong pedal. You're using the wrong guitar. Your brain isn't in the right place. You know, your heart's not in the right place. You're not, you know, you're not in the right room. You're not using the right distortion pedal, uh, boost pedal, amp. You know, there's something wrong in the mixture there. If, if, if things aren't working, it's because something's wrong and you might have to go away and come back another day and to do it. But, invariably you, you you need to just kind of like go by what you feel you know you really do it's super important um but uh 
yeah, I, I, I don't know. yeah, be that for it, maybe people I'm getting all zen on you again. But uh, yeah, that, that's the way I think. That's the way my brain works, and that's the way I perceive things. That's the way music works for me. Like I say, I just don't, I don't think about it. You know, music just tells me, and I just go with it. You know, I'm, I'm not going to question music. It's been around forever. It knows better than I do. I'm just it's pawn until I'm not here anymore. You know, and if it says it wants this guitar, it wants this guitar. If it wants that chord progression. It, it, it wants that chord progression and you give it to it you know if I want, oh no I want that pedal and I want that pedal and I want this I want you to play like that you know and you just go unconscious to it and it'll just guide you and that's it you know music music is always the biggest part of what you do it's not about kind of like oh I've, I've learned this sweet picking technique that I want to really show off and I want to shred if music goes no you don't do it you know it's in my opinion it's like no no you're not doing that I don't want you to and I don't you know I don't require that of you right now you know and I don't feel you should ever go against that I think it's important to kind of like you know to not to definitely not ever to to always um go with music and never go against it you know you listen to it and you let it guide you um because like I say it knows better than we do anyway um but yeah coming back to your question like yeah just just to recap yeah what do I get to get a guitar sound ds2 wah pedal jackhammer Jobs are good in. Invariably, neck pickup uh, or bridge. Never really in the middle. But uh, yeah, one of those. And that's it. That, yeah, and it, and it, it all, the rest just comes from there. comes from music. So uh, so yeah. So anyway, I hope that's such a question. Uh, I hope answer questions are okay. People tube as usual. I feel I've totally made a mess of them. But what's new there? Anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed this A&Q Wednesday, everybody. If you want to uh, submit a question for A&Q, description box below has an email link. Email me there and i'll get to it uh yeah other than that uh thank you very much indeed for watching hope you enjoyed this vid and i'll see you again uh on friday for another one have a great morning afternoon good evening goodbye now thank you much indeed for watching.